It's a difficult one because you, you're never going to find the word Jewish ethics sitting in our ancient sources. It, we don't use that term. Um, although most, a lot of the more modern books on Jewish business ethics will use exactly that term to link up with business ethics in other faiths and other, other religions and other settings. I find that a lot of what I'm really teaching and actually dealing with starts off as Jewish business law and Jewish business principles. Um, but because you can't apply them directly to exactly what happens today, they turn into ethics, as in how do you make a decision about what the right thing to do is in a particular circumstance. And, and that leads on to wider discussions? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So one of the things that I'm, you know, sort of for me that's really important to do is to look at real issues of today and to see what guidance our tradition gives us and you know why why do we study that tradition how can it help us and I, I remember I had a wonderful um, opportunity to spend time with Mayor Tamari one of the uh, kind of doyens of, uh, Jew, of Jewish business ethics um, and a rabbi uh, but also once chief economist in the Bank of Israel and in a lot of the books that he wrote, he said, you know, what I realise is it doesn't matter which century you're in, which millennium you're in, you've still got the opportunity to cheat people, to tell people what they need to know before they buy something off you, or not, take advantage, not take advantage, um, work with people in a fair and decent way or not. And that doesn't matter whether you are selling somebody an ox somewhere in a market in Caesarea, <laughs> during the Roman times or Greek times, or whether you are uh, selling shares or uh, in, in, a, in a bourse somewhere. Same, same principles. I suppose my reflection on that is it raises real questions about the extent to which our Jewish values are unchanging. Because in progressive Judaism, we do talk about not just rating things relevant, but making sure that in certain issues, certainly around gender and feminism and so on, that we need to think of today's values. But think, you're talking yeah. about unchanging values. I yes, think. because I think sometimes that, I think sometimes what we're busy doing is trying to work out what are the unchanging values. And the unchanging values may be things about honesty, transparency, respect and such like, and they don't change, but the way that you put them into action do change as the world changes. Um, and I, I think that's part of what we're all about. I so often find that when you're studying ancient Jewish texts as a, as a reform or liberal Jew, what you find in them is different examples of the same question. But those examples are from, from the past. But the question hasn't changed. Sort of the... the what is the right way, what is a way of thinking that feels godly and right? That doesn't change. What do you, what do you feel? Do you, do you feel that our values are something fixed? Or do you feel that the values change? I suppose, again, you asked me the question about ethics. I suppose yeah. the problem is I'm using the word values. And again, you're not going to find that in... Jewish sources, the word values is something that we work, we, we, we now use that word because it helps us to be able to, to teach. Well, I think one of the things I pick up from my own uh, Lairhouse class in, in classical Greek, uh, which has always been online, it's been online for, th for three years, we have such a diverse mm. group from around Europe. But one of the things I pick up from our reading is how much there can be in ancient stories that shows us that human nature and the way we behave to each other just, just doesn't change. When you're teaching Greek, is that what you're using? You're using um, old Greek sources? Yes, so yeah. the reason the class was set up originally was because of a request from a couple of lecturers at uh -huh. the college that they wanted classical Greek to inform their own research and Jewish studies. Right. And there is a huge amount of ancient Jewish literature in Greek, starting with the Septuagint, which right. is the ancient translation mm. of the Bible, the very first translation. 
but also a lot of books which are known as pseudepigrapha, which yeah, yeah. are forgotten about now. Mm -hmm. But really kind of a lot of them are like novels. So we've been studying one called The Testament of Job, right. which is like a sort of novella, mm -hmm. imagining Job on his deathbed with his, his uh, wife and new family gathered around him, uh, telling them what happened to him, but mm -hmm. embellishing the story in all sorts of fanciful ways which are not in the Bible. There are certain cultural concepts which are part of what we call the Hellenistic tradition, mm -hmm. uh, which didn't exist before. In the story of Adam and Eve, for example, uh, when they realized that they were naked, before that it says they were naked, but they were not ashamed. Yes. Now that's very unusual because if you try and think of an ancient Hebrew term for embarrassment, mm -hmm. it really doesn't exist in the mm -hmm. same way. I know we got that. In fact, I think there's a thing in the Talmud, isn't there, about making face, someone's face turn yes, white? Yes, yes, yes. Yes? Whereas we think of it as red. Yeah. Uh, but once you turn to Greek literature, there's quite a lot about that kind of concept and, and one's personal emotional reaction to things that I don't think you'd really find in biblical literature in the same way. So it's interesting, to, coming back, going back to values and the words that we use in translation and why learn these different languages. Um, a very important principle in Jewish business ethics is to avoid ganevat da'at. Now, ganav, stealing, da'at, the mind. Stealing the mind, what on earth does that mean? Now in English, it doesn't mean anything. But that concept says that if you don't reveal something about a deal that you are trying to do, you have stolen the value of the deal that the person thought they were getting from their mind, and it's no different to reaching into their pocket and stealing the money value that makes a difference. And therefore, you need to almost put yourself into their position before you, uh, before you trade with them. It's like an empathy is required, which comes out of using the word geneva da'at, that you could never kind of say, you know, uh, trade with people ethically. Well, what does that mean? And it means a value of putting yourself in the other person's position and caring about them comes beautifully out of the Hebrew. So it's one of the, again, one of the reasons to, to go back to ancient texts when one's discussing today's business situations. It sounds like the same thing happens through Greek as well, that you're going to express concepts that you'll be unable to express any other way. Yes, in a way. I'm really interested in that, that rabbinic concept of Geneva Dad. And I was wondering, in that kind of way of thinking about it, is it always an individual's responsibility or is there also a collective responsibility? Yeah, or well, there's a collective responsibility in terms of effectively trading standards. Wow. You know, how do you set things out? So one of the, one of the issues in, in Geneva Da'at is if you go to an agent who is selling, let's go for oxen, because as soon as you say selling oxen, you put yourself into a different century who's selling oxen. Is it any different to going you and me buying or selling, my, I'm buying your ox or not? Right. And the sense is that the agent doesn't have the same level of information as you have. Therefore, they cannot be accused of stealing the mind for things that they don't know about. Um, and then there becomes that question about what their responsibility is to find out about things. Um, how much must they know about a defect? And then that question about what's the responsibility of a customer to tell them what they're going to use the ox for. So are they going to use it to slaughter it for meat? Or are they going to use it to plough a field? In which case, if you're going to use it to plough a field, it needs to be very, very strong, etc. If you're going to use it to slaughter it for meat, it needs to be nice and fat. Mm -hmm. Completely different things that you need, would need to be clear and honest about. And those effectively become trading standards. So one of the issues, just in this particular one, is uh, that you mustn't soak meat when you're going to sell it in water to make it appear fatter. I think you should tell some of our... Modern day supermarkets. Oh, I, I, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But that becomes a public standard, yeah. a shared standard. Whereas if your ox, you happen to know, is lame and you are trying, and I'm maybe buying it because I'm going to plough a field, mm -hmm. then, you, then you really ought to tell me about that. But I ought to have told you that's what I'm going to buy it for. 
just the same as if I buy, I don't know, a computer off you, and my intention is just to, is just to play Zoom conversations or something like that. It doesn't need to have quite the quality that it would need if I was going to use it for all of my work. So it's not caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, it's let the seller beware. Uh, it's a mixture. It's both of them. It's a sense that whoever you are, <coughs> buyer or seller, you're a human being in that transaction. And I find that, that very special. So that takes you back to ethics, because it's yeah. still person to person. How do we work person to person? Are there links with Roman law? Um, at times there are, definitely. You can see that there's market law that's coming from sources around us and that we are incorporating into, into Jewish law. That's also this idea of dina da malchuta dina. At times the law of the land is the law, meaning that if a standard is required from that country which is higher than your own standard out, out of halakha, then you ought to go for that. You need to start with that. But again, that's a big debate in itself. I mean, this is something that really informs my own thinking. I, I cannot believe that the principles and indeed details of our faith and our law have ever developed in isolation. And we've always been influenced and affected by the other cultures and faiths, uh, well, faiths around us. Talking about, again, it takes us a little bit back to language because there are Persian terms, there are Latin terms, there are Greek terms in our texts for uh, things to do with, with trade, with buying, with selling, with hiring, with firing, etc. Um, that come, that are because we're interacting with other peoples around us. And presumably when, when, going back to Greek, when Greek is being used by Jews to write their stories, it's because that's who they're living amongst. Is that right? And that's, that's their language. Absolutely. It was the language of Josephus. It was the language of Philo. In the Cairo Geniza, there are bits of prayers and Haggadot in, in Greek. And it was a very widespread language. Though I do think, actually, one language that we learned so little about, which was even more widespread in its time, was Arabic. Mm. Mm. Uh, our communities do not realize that if you go back a thousand years, 90% of Jews in the world either spoke or had some exposure to the Arabic language. And because that was a common language, among the Muslims they were living with, from Baghdad to Spain, mm -hmm. you've got a totally different culture of Jews and non-Jews speaking the same language from that which later developed in Europe, where Jews were speaking Yiddish and the non-Jews were speaking Russian, German, Polish, and so on. And I suspect, paradoxically actually, that in those countries, Jews were much more isolated because of it. Ah, that's interesting. So, you know, you, uh, when you were talking about the uh, language of Philo, the language of Josephus, of course, it was also the language used in the market in Alexandria um, from the person who was, you know, had a business there of whatever yeah. sort it might be. But going back to going to Arabic, quite a lot of the examples often used when we're looking at Jewish business ethics are about trade between peoples of different cultures and you can tell they can obviously can work together they are able to the person who's working for them may not be a fellow jew um, the person who they're trading with may not be a fellow jew are there any different standards is one of the other issues which you might say is only an issue if you go back that far in time but it's not it's an issue now which is does it matter if you have a personal relationship or some kind of quasi-tribal relationship with the person that you're doing business with, or is that irrelevant? Um, should you have the same standard for everybody? Um, and we still do that, you know, the people that you know better. Um, and I guess it's also that ability of Jews to be able to pick up the languages of the people that they are living amongst is extremely important. If you go to the Cairo Geniza, you can see lots of different of receipts in Judeo-Arabic. So it's Arabic, however, it's written in Hebrew, in Hebrew characters. Um, and there's a, there's, there's, that's, uh, there are some wonderful, wonderful pieces there which also show the interactions between people and the interfaith relationships rather deeper than we would have thought um, on, I suppose, on our fond imaginings that Jews just lived among Jews. <laughs> um, wasn't the case, and so we had to work out how we're related.
Um, I've just been having a few lessons from the new Oxford School of Red Jewish Languages in Judeo Arabic. And one of the texts we were looking at was a prescription, a medical prescription, right. uh, which is in Cambridge, in that mm -hmm. Geniza collection, written in Maimonides' own mm -hmm. handwriting, which mm -hmm. is quite incredible. And the thing that really surprised me that I wasn't expecting was that when he was gathering together all the, the herbs and so on that had to go in the medicine, he was using Persian terms. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think... Written, ever... in, written in Hebrew characters, <laughs> yes. I take it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I don't think he ever visited Persia. Uh, but it's one of these things where the, the lecturer said that the name travelled with the substance, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there are, of course, words which seem to be in Hebrew written, uh, and you can understand them as English, like sandal, for example, yeah. and sack each of which, that's what the Hebrew is, that's what the Aramaic is, etc., because these are trade terms. You talk about Maimonides. Um, there's one interesting, uh, among the interesting passages of Maimonides, there are millions, of course, is the idea of being able to overcharge somebody, to charge somebody an amount which gives you what would otherwise be seen as an excessive profit, and that it is possible to do that. There's a general principle that there's kind of a maximum price to be charged for something. You shouldn't take a profit basically of more than, uh, more than a sixth. Mm -hmm. But two people can set that aside as long as they both agree it. And the question is, in what circumstances would you ever do that? And one of them would be if the person who's got to you whatever you wanted, let's say fine silks from China, has had an incredibly dangerous time to go and get them, and has taken enormous risks, and frankly is not going to do it for a profit of a sixth, and therefore would, uh, you need to agree a larger profit margin. Um, and this is in Maimonides' writing. Now, of course, he was part of his connections between Jews in Egypt, Jews in uh, Mumbai, in India, who'd already settled there, Jews in Yemen, etc. And presumably, they must have had to deal with these different languages between them, just like we do, um, just as Jews do today. That whole concept of a restriction on profits is so fascinating, because hmm. we don't have it today. I remember, was it in the uh, 70s, a Labour government introduced... Uh, price maintenance and set yeah, back yeah. some retail prices for things it didn't really do a lot yeah. for our economy. So, okay, so one interesting Jewish eth business ethics issue that we'll look at in the course is uh, what about utilities? Because utilities do have that. And that's partly how a whole bunch of companies have gone bust recently <laughs> because they can't charge more. Again, what I love going back to the language thing is the word used for this is on a a. Mm -hmm. which comes from the idea that one person should not harm another yeah. person. So harming, that overcharging somebody harms them, but also it goes the other way around. You know, you talked about caveat emptor, caveat vendor, that if you, if you as the customer realise you've got yourself a ridiculous bargain, you, the seller, should be able to come back and say, I'm sorry, I undercharged you for that. I need you to pay, pay me more. And there was a system of market inspectors who could compare prices across uh, in an area to make sure that that was actually fair. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's people to people. And again, the language makes a difference to it.